Okay, all right, sorry I'm late. Uh, I would blame it on the weather, but that's not really true. I just had a different meeting that ran over. Um, anyways, so today we're going to be talking about hidden Markov models. So I said during the last lecture that this is going to be a two-lecture series, but I looked again at, so when I was scheduling all these lectures, I was kind of going off of what Professor Isong was doing. But he went through all these slides in the first lecture, and then went through some kind of more advanced slides, and then just did a loose lecture for the second one. And I don't really see a need to do that. So this lecture, we're going to cover all of HMM, and that's going to cover everything you need to know. And then I think, so Tuesday, that leaves Tuesday empty. So I think the plan is for me to just do kind of a potpourri lecture on Tuesday, where after this lecture and then on Piazza, just tell me what you're interested in hearing about, or what your interests are, or what kind of lecture you might be interested in hearing. And then I'll kind of take that into account put some of my own research in there, put some of my own interested things in there, and we'll just do a kind of a survey of advanced machine learning topics in general. But if there's anything you're interested in, that's kind of your chance to um, influence uh, the lecture content. Um, and then also, if you're here in person, then I'll take notes on my paper, and then you'll have more of an influence on the decisions that I make compared to just being on Piazza. Um, so that's the benefit of coming to class. Um, anyways, so that's the plan. and then. Next Thursday and then Tuesday, those are the advanced topics lectures, again, with Dr. Mandrake, um, who will talk about interpretability and explainability, as well as kind of ML ops, so deploying ML models in the, in the real world, whatever that means. Um, so that's kind of what our schedule looks like. But today, we're going to cover all of HMM. So the second lecture on Tuesday will not be an HMM lecture. That will be more of a free form, talk about whatever I want, talk about whatever you want, that kind of a lecture. Okay, but this is the last core lecture slide. Um, and this is the last topic that will be covered in the last homework, as well as in the last uh, project, project three. Sounds good? All right. All right, so let's just get right into it. Um, so today we're going to be talking about hidden Markov models. And we've talked about hidden Markov models briefly before um, during the last lecture um, when kind of we talked about naive Bayes, and then we kind of attached it to the end, right? So we're going to start kind of back at the, instead of going directly into the model itself, we're going to start back at kind of the task that motivates it, and then we're going to roll into it, and then we're going to compare it to naive Bayes and, and, and things like that. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about sequence prediction. So this is a very common NLP task, um, but it also kind of appears in a lot of different areas as well. But language is, by definition, a sequence. And so you, you'll see a lot of this in uh, natural language processing. Um, but this is kind of the simplest task that we can talk about. And in, in this particular task, which is called part of speech tagging, it's where, given a sentence, right, we want to tag what, each, uh, what part of speech each word is. right? So in fish sleep, that would be noun verb. Um, the dog ate my homework, that would be um, so we're going to replace articles with the tag determiner um, just to simplify the task a little bit. So it will be a determiner, a noun, a verb, a determiner, and then a noun. And then the fox jumped over the fence. That would be determiner, noun, verb, uh, preposition, um, and then determiner, noun. So, that, so this is just called a part of speech tag. Um, so this is, again, fairly common. You don't have to tag part of speeches either. Like there's other tagging tasks that you can come up with. But the idea is a sentence comes in and a sequence comes out, right? So in this case, a sentence comes in and a sequence of part of speeches come out. In other cases, it might we might be tagging proper nouns. So is this a name? Is this not a name? Or location tags or object tags? Like there's a lot of different tags that you can do. Um, but this particular task that we're going to talk about is uh, part of speech tagging. Um, I also want to mention, you know. If you actually do machine uh, do NLP, the kind of uh, not the nomenclature, but but the kind of syntax that you'll see is the tag will come after a slash, so it'll be the dog ate my homework. Right. So if you follow through with NLP, this is kind of the structure that you'll see this as. Um, but here we're just representing them as x and y vectors. So the challenge of this kind of a task is 
that first you have this multi-variable output, right? So we're not just predicting is this sentence one or zero, we're predicting a sequence from an input sequence. So just the fact that it's a multivariable output poses a challenge. The other challenge, and we saw this a uh, little bit when we talked about RNNs uh, during the deep learning lectures, is that we have a variable length input and output, right? So we can't guarantee that a sentence will be a certain length. So whatever model we design here has to be able to um, kind of accommodate um, input and output lengths of varying length. So let's talk a little bit about the difficulty of having multivariate outputs. So when we have an input fish sleep and an output noun verb, right, if we treat a noun verb as like one output, right, so it's not like word output, word output. If we treat, we have input fish sleep as a sequence and then we have output um, noun verb as the output, you know, the one way we can kind of do this is we can train a different weight, we can train a different classifier almost for each possible y output, right? So for every combination, so noun verb, noun noun, noun determiner, noun proposition, whatnot, we can train a different model um, for the input, right? So that's, that's kind of the easiest um, way of doing it. But the key here is that the number of classes scales not with, you know, how many tags are there, so not how many noun, verb. Uh, I think in this task we're doing, okay, determiner, noun, verb, adjective, adverb, preposition. So it's not six, it's six to the length of the sequence, right? So if we, if we treat this as a, again, a completely naive multi-class uh, multi prediction task, um, we have to treat all possible combinations of length m as its own class. So if we ignore all sequence-based models, again, uh, that we've covered before, this is how you would have to do it. And so with length two, you get six, six squared. Uh, so you have 36 classes that you need to classify in between. Length three, you have six to the third, six to the fourth, et cetera. So it's, 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 it's exponential um, complexity. So this is what happens when you have a model that's unstructured, right? So anytime you have a model that's trying to kind of blindly, naively predict uh oh. Okay. Let's give that a second. All right. That was scary. I think I just unplugged this by accident because I moved my. All right. All right. Anyways, so again, uh, we have this exponential explosion in the number of classes, and we've seen this before, right? Uh, where if you kind of try to naively learn everything, um, uh, the, the, the task becomes intractable. So again, an example with length three, you have some input sequence, and then the output, you have to learn a classifier that classifies between all these possible combinations. So the alternative to this, which is kind of what the naive Bayes model was doing, was to make this independent independence uh, assumption, right? So if we treat each word independently, we can do independent multi-class prediction per word, right? So we can ignore the sequence altogether, and we can just say per word, what is the likely tag for each word, right? So for example, for the word I, we can predict what the tag for that would be independently. And then for the word fish, we, we would predict its tag independently. And then for the word often, we would again um, tag that independently. And then afterwards, we just concatenate those individual uh, predictions, right? So in this case, at least we fixed the number of classes problem, right? There's always six classes because we're predicting one class per word, ignoring the uh, order of the sequence itself. Yeah? So I might not be following the but isn't this like a deterministic? Like we, the fish is always going to be. Yes. And so like there's no real prediction task in it. it might, like, well, you got to learn the model first. Yeah. saying in the beginning that this word was for this whatever tag, mm -hmm. and then you just reloading the tags again? Like, what's, what's the... So, so, so in, this in this very naive example, yeah. right, you would have some data set of sentences and their tags, right? Yeah. And then so you would just learn this word is most often uh, hi the highest probability of this word is a verb okay. or is a noun, right? And then when you do the prediction, right, it, it would be, if you're just taking the argmax, it would be deterministic, 
But you could imagine if we're treating this as a generative model, you know, you could um, randomly sample from whatever distribution, right? But again, very naive uh, example, so don't worry about it too much. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm not presenting this as the correct option here. This is a thought experiment to get to the correct, uh, correct model. Yes, this is bad. And the next slide will explain that this is bad, right? <laughs> so um, if we treat each word independently, and you can kind of treat this in the naive phase way where we just count frequencies, right? And we try to say um, in the training data set, how many times is the word I a noun, right? And then the word I is in the English language at least, is it's always a noun, right? So we can say that the probability of noun conditioned on x is always gonna be one, right? Because it's it's noun. Um, but as, as students are starting to point out, if we do this, there are words in the English language that are nouns or verbs, right? But changes depending, completely depending on the context, right? Um, and so this is, this is I, I do wanna point out, this is like a language specific problem. Right? So there are languages where this is not a problem, where you know, part of speech tagging is not a difficult problem because words are always something. Or um, maybe in some Latin languages, like there's conjugation. right? And so it's very easy to tell um, if something is a noun or a verb or, or, or et cetera. But at least in English, um, because of the fascinating uh, linguistic properties of English, where it's basically a combination of four or five different languages, right? we, have, we have this condition uh, where the word fish um, it can be a noun to describe an actual fish, or it can be a verb to fish, to catch fish, right? Um, and so, as you're pointing out, if we do independent classification, um, it's not obvious which one it should be. And so, we end up with a model that makes a mistake in, in this particular scenario um, because the training set, in the training set, the word fish was most often a noun, but clearly in this context, fish is a verb. Uh, here, let me, I gotta mute my computer because I'm getting email notifications. <laughs> All right, there we go. All okay, so obviously this doesn't work because we need the context from the, from the, from the uh, context between words, right? So independent predictions, um, if we just predict the tag per word, completely ignore pairings or completely ignore the sequence um, of, of, of the words. So as, as this points out, in isolation, fish is more likely to be a noun in some given data set, but conditioned on following a noun or a pronoun, right, fish is more likely to be a verb, especially if it immediately follows a noun or a pronoun. So this is the kind of dependencies that we want to capture. And we saw this already as well from kind of the music sequencing example, right, or the language modeling example, where um, we're trying to capture these relationships uh, between, between adjacent elements in a sequence. So that's where the kind of first order dependence uh, comes in, right? The, and previously we talked about the first order Markov um, assumption where we say each word kind of depends on the word that, came, that preceded it. Um, I should mention that, again, you know, um, in the world of NLP, uh, it's, it, it's not just pairs. Uh, they do go up to triplets, right? Or in the case of a skip gram, depending on that window size, um, you know, it, that window can get a lot larger. Um, and there are things like bigram models and trigram models, which is out of scope um, for this particular lecture, um, that tries to um, capture second order dependencies um, as well. Because um, you can also, you know, just of the English language, we do, the English language has a lot of skips, right? There's a lot of cases where a clause comes like six words after the noun that it describes, um, because it's complicated. So uh, because of that, it's um, of interest to capture these higher order dependencies as well. But for now, we're just going to assume this first order dependence. Um, and yeah, if you have an arbitrary order, um, instead of the first order or second order, it becomes exponential, right? So that's why we stick to the one, two, maybe three, um, third order uh, mark, uh, dependencies. So let's real quickly kind of cover this first order um, Oh, actually, wait, hold on. I thought we were gonna, I thought, I thought we were gonna go over to first order Markov dependence, but no, we're actually gonna go ahead and define a hidden Markov model now. So this is, this model was designed to really kind of take advantage of the first order assumption 
and kind of embed that into a naive Bayes model, right? So we're um, and and we're kind of leveraging both of those. So we're we're leveraging the naive Bayes assumption, but also we're leveraging this first order Markov assumption um, in order to kind of do well on these sequence tasks. So that's kind of the intent um, behind designing this model. So the goal, as always, and this is a generative model, right? This is a probabilistic model. So just as a quick reminder, the goal of these kind of models is to model this joint probability distribution of x comma y, right? So that's that's always our top level goal. But as we did in naive phase, we're going to take a, take advantage of some independence assumptions and some dependency um, assumptions in order to kind of break that down into smaller elements that can be easily memorized in some kind of a lookup table. Um, or in, in a much smaller number of parameters that's like not exponentially, um, that's not like exponential complexity. So um, again, so we have this X sequence of words and we have Y POS tags. This is like a, we're currently gonna set this up as a supervised task and as I've said before during the probability lecture, um, you know, the line between these is gonna get blurred um, pretty heavily um, when, once we kind of go into the definitions and such here. But, for now, you know, we have this input x, and we have this uh, label or output y, where given some sequence of words, we're trying to uh, predict what the sequence of those POS tags, uh, part of speech tags are. And as a part of this model, we're going to memorize these four quantities. And the latter two are kind of optional, but the first two are, are the most important. So first, the model's going to learn the probability of x conditioned on y. So note, this is flipped again, right? So same thing with naive phase, where it, seemed flipped, but it's not really flipped because we're not trying to make this input output assumption, but for the supervised case, it seems flipped. So we're uh, estimating the probability of x conditioned on y, or in this case, probability of state y generating x. That's just another way of saying it. Um, and then the second thing that we're going to memorize is this, uh, what I call this transition probability, right? So the probability of one part of speech tag coming after another part of speech track, right? So probability of noun um, being the third element conditioned on the fact that the second element is a verb, for example, right? And so um, spoken in this language, probability of state y transitioning to the state y after. So y super i to y super i plus one. And then we have these kind of additional factors here um, just to be able to handle starting and ending sequences because like we said, this length can be kind of variable. Um, and so that's why we have these things. But we'll, this will make more sense once we get into the graphical representation and we walk through some examples. OK? Do you have a question? I know. Uh, but I think maybe we'll answer it. Yeah, give me one more slide and see if that makes sense. OK. All right, so in the, in the graphical representation, this is what that looks like. And again, each kind of column here looks like naive phase, right? But we're adding this transition probability that goes from y1 to y2. So y2 is conditioned on y1, y3 is conditioned on y2, et cetera. Um, and then note, again, that each x is only conditioned on its corresponding y, right? So y1, x1 is conditioned on y1, x2 is conditioned on y2, et cetera. So you can follow those arrows and you can kind of interpret what this model structure looks like. Um, so this joint probability, um, this joint probability is now, can now be expressed as this product um, where, again, we can kind of ignore this end because um, this is just a formality just to be able to handle the fact that a sequence ends. So we need to provide the model an opportunity to stop. Um, but this area here, um, we're, we're, the assumption is that all of these arrows combined, all of these arrows multiplied, um, defines this joint distribution of x comma y. OK, so we can kind of, um, hold on. Yeah, so we can kind of um, interpret this in, in context of the task, right? That each, each word only depends on its corresponding POS tag. And then each POS tag only depends on which POS tag it came before it, right? So if we're kind of looking at this from a generative standpoint, um, and we're going to kind of cover that example in a couple slides here. That doesn't seem like the best way to generate a sentence, right? Like a sentence generated using this might not make sense. But remember, we're trying to give it the we're trying to give it x's, and we're trying to predict the y's, right? So we're 
eventually trying to do probability of y conditioned on x, right? Um, but you know, as as you kind of stare at this graph, that's kind of what you should be thinking about, right? Which ways are the arrows um, pointing? What's dependent on what? And um, what are the assumptions that the model is taking? And you can do this with any Markov chain, right? This is just a special one particular case of a Markov chain model. Um, but you can draw these, again, circles and arrows in any way to fit uh, some particular uh, model or task or data that you're trying to do. Oh, uh, one thing that we also want to mention is the, the significance of the colors of these circles. So actually, the dark circles indicate some observed variable, and the empty circles indicate some unobserved variable. And that's because you can actually train this model unsupervised just on the text. And we're going to cover that towards the end of lecture. But that's at least what this indicates in terms of you know, why it's dark and light. Um, the dark circles are observed, and the um, light circles are unobserved. But in this particular case, they're both observed. Yeah? So I think I'm perhaps slightly confused why we're doing p of x given y and not p of y given x. But I, I, it might be because we're trying to maximize the light curve. Right, so we're just trying to, yeah, we're just trying to maximize the likelihood of this joint distribution. Yeah. We don't actually care about getting the best, yeah. yeah. But, but so if we're, if we're doing the, the joints, we could also just do P of Y given X or P of X I given X I minus 1. Right, we can like kind of flip, flip this. You could, but let's look at the complexity of this model. Okay. Right, um, so, all right, let me see how many slides out we have that. But. Hopefully, yeah, pretty soon here. So, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. And let, let's see if we can get to that. So, again, just to kind of lay this out on the, on the equations that we covered before, again, there's our joint probability distribution definition um, uh, where we have our, again, transition probabilities and the probability of each word conditioned on a tag. Um, so those are the two that we memorize. And then, again, we have this um, uh, start state probability where we say um, what, uh, excuse me, what tag are we likely to start with? And then we have this um, where we're trying to predict um, the probability of ending uh, after a certain tag. So that, that's, that's, this is just a formality just to make sure we can start and end the sequence. So one kind of interesting consequence of this is that if we're given some part of speech tag sequence y, right? So let's say I have, I already have, I don't know, noun verb, pronoun, uh, noun verb, adjective noun, preposition. That's not an actual sentence, but let's say I already have some sequence y. We can actually compute each um, xi independently, right? So if for some reason we're trying to uh, generate x from some given y, because of the structure of the model, Right? Because each x is only dependent on its corresponding y, we can actually generate all the y's first and then generate the x's. Right? So we can do those all in parallel. So we can compute each um, p of x conditioned on y um, independently. So that's just a direct consequence of the assumptions we're making in this model. So let's look at what the actual model is learning, right? So let's look at the parameters that the model is actually learning. So first, it's modeling all state-state pairs, right? So state is what we call those hidden nodes, those unobserved nodes uh, y, uh, uh, y, right? Where um, we need to learn all part of speech tag-tag pairs, right? So how often does it go from noun to noun? Oh, or what's the probability of going noun to noun, noun to verb, noun to adjective, et cetera. So that's, that's one table that we need to build. The other table that we need to build is all state observation pairs, right? So all tag word pairs. So um, again, uh, here, what's the probability of a word given some um, tag, right? So the number, the complexity of parameters that we need to learn is first um, part of speech tag squared, right? So in this, in this case, we have six, noun, verb, adjective, whatnot. So six squared, so 36 for this first state-state transition probability pairs. And then we have, excuse me. And then we need to um, learn this other table, which is 
um, the state observation. So that's the number of words times the number of tags, right? That's the other one that we need to memorize. That, that's the other table that we need to memorize. Um, and we want to point out that this has the same complexity. That table has the same complexity as just independent multi-class, right? Where we're just predicting a class from each word. It's the same table um, that we're doing that. So the reason that we've set it up this way is because if we had flipped x and y here, that state state table would become the number of words times the number of words, right? So that parameter becomes like 10,000 times 10,000. And so then it becomes intractable. And so by kind of structuring it this way, instead we learn a lot less, um, lot less parameters for our model. Does that make sense? Okay, okay so I've, I've been kind of alluding to this uh, throughout the lecture, but the relationship to naive phase is that in naive phase, you know, we, we were memorizing p of y and then p of x given y, right? But we're just adding this um, additional dependence, uh, this additional condi uh, conditional dependence between the y's, right? And that, again, drawing those arrows between the y's and not the x's makes this model tractable, makes this model actually be able to be learned um, given a pretty sizable dictionary. All right, so let's walk through some um, kind of examples on, uh, on what this looks like. So again, we're, we're going to get to predicting a tag based on a word soon, but we're just going to handle, we're just going to tackle the easy ones. Um, so we have, let's say we have this learned, oh, let's say we have, we have this learned model. Um, oh, okay, so let's say the English language only consists of the words fish and sleep. Right, <laughs> and then let's assume that there's only two parts of speech in this language: noun and verb. Right, um, and so given a tag sequence, right? So we're not we're not sampling tags here. Given some tag sequence: noun, verb, noun, verb, 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 and noun, noun. Right. So assuming that this is the tag that we want, the likelihood that the likelihood of the sentence being fish sleep, right, is like 0.8 times 0.5 because Fish, uh, fish given noun is 0.8, right? And then sleep given verb is 0.5. So we have 0.8 times 0.5. So again, the point here being each word is only conditioned on its corresponding y, right? It doesn't care about what the previous actual word was. Um, and here we don't we don't even care about the transition probabilities, right? Because our pair is already given. Both of our both of our y's are already given. And so we just need to multiply, you know, p of x given y. Um, to, you know, to, to each other, and that's, that's just the probability. Yeah, so it factorizes into a product of independent probabilities. Okay, and I kind of alluded to this earlier as well, um, where uh, if we were to sample from a model like this, um, and because HMM is a generative model, it's a probabilistic model, whoops, um, and it models this joint distribution, we can generate samples from the distri distribution that's learned. So um, if we consider, again, this same conditional distribution table, um, given some tag sequence y, uh, noun and verb, right, we can sample what the most likely word for each tag would be, right? So um, given noun and verb, first we would sample probability of um, x1 given noun. So in this case, it would be, um, 8% fish and point, uh, sorry, 80% fish and 20% sleep, right? And then for the verb tag, we will do the same. Um, yeah, 50% fish and 50% sleep. Okay. Um, and then, you know, if you, you can sample the, uh, obviously you can sample the tags too, right? So if we're only given that the first Y is a noun, right? You would look at your transition probabilities table, which isn't up here right now but you would be able to see what the most likely next tag is given that the first one was a noun. And so if that happened to be a verb, then you could go on, move on and sample the x. Does that make sense? We're just, again, we're just following the paths um, of, of this diagram here. I'm actually gonna draw this on the board so I can point at it when I'm talking instead of waving my hands around, so just a second. Okay. 
Oh, he is going to talk about forward sampling. Oh, whoops. All right. So that example I had about uh, sampling the Ys as well, right, so, so instead of just sampling given some tag sequence, you can completely uh, sample from the actual full joint distribution, right? So this is called forward sampling. And so given, so let me, let me describe what you're seeing here. So on the top left, we have those um, conditional, prob conditional probabilities, right? The probability of x given y. This is a kind of a Markov chain um, description of the transition model, right? So all the, each of these arrows is a cell on one of these tables, right? So it's just saying probability of starting as a noun is 80%. Probability of starting as a verb is 20%, right? And then given conditioned on um, y1 being a noun, the probability of y2 being a noun is uh, 10%. Probability of the verb being the next tag is 80%. Um, and then the probability of the sequence just ending is 10%, right? So again, you can imagine this is just a table, but written out so that it looks fancy. And then you can kind of follow it along, right? Um, and this works because it's a transition probability. You can't, you can't do this with a table like this because we're going um, x from y. Um, but here, because we're going from y to y, y to y, we can kind of plot out these transitions um, as this Markov chain diagram. So in order to do forward sampling, right, you initialize. So we have, we're given nothing. We're just given the model. We're not given any, any input. We're just sampling from the joint distribution, right? So we initialize with y0 as start. We start at the start tag, right? So this is, this is why we include the start tag. Um, and then for the next y1, you can sample y1 from y0, right? So um, you do some sampling with noun as the 80% and verb as the 20%, right? Um, you can take the max of this if you'd like, if you want the most likely sentence, I guess. If you want the most likely distribution, you would just take the maximum. But you know, you can always roll the dice, generate some random number, and take whichever path uh, you end up with, right? So you sample y from the previous y, and then if y happens to be end, uh, you, you stop, right? Because you're, again, sampling from this joint distribution. Um, but you can't end up at end from start, so uh, let's just say we, we got the noun. And then for noun, we sample, once we're at a tag, we sample the corresponding x from that tag, right? So we, from noun, we either sample fish with 80% or sleep with 20%. Um, and then afterwards, again, we iterate to now super two. Um, we sample the next tag, and then we again sample the word from that tag. Okay? So note, again, like I mentioned before, that because of the independence, the condition, uh, the dependence assumptions that, that are made here, you can sample all of y first, right? So you can just come up with, you can just sample noun, verb, noun, preposition, noun, that. First, so you can finish this line first, and then for each tag, you can just sample their respective words. Right. So intuitively, this does not end up with a good sentence, <laughs> right? Like it doesn't per se result in a sentence that makes sense. But again, that's not the point of the model, right? So we're we're just doing this to be able to learn um, the tagging. Right? It's not really meant to generate some like good sentence, if you will. You could also just not have the stop condition at the end and just stop when you reach a certain length, right? So uh, Yisong's kind of notating this as uh, the joint distribution of yx given some length l, right? So at some length l, you just stop sampling, right? And actually, this example has the case where on step three, um, well, no, it's not doing that. Never mind. But you could do that. You could just predict up to y and then predict all the x's after. All right, so again, as a quick summary, uh, we've uh, we covered the definition of a first order hidden Markov model. Um, this is often referred to as a memory less model because, again, you only need yk or y something, y at some position to uh, model the rest of the rest of the sequence. It really doesn't care what came before this node, right? It only cares about um, that current tag to, to um, class to predict or to generate the rest of the sequence, right? Or to generate any kind of probability. All right, does anyone have questions about the first order hidden Markov model? 
pretty straightforward. It's just naive Bayes with transition probabilities. And these kind of dependency assumptions leads to some very interesting uh, uh, things, done, uh, things afterwards. OK, cool. So now we're actually going to talk about predicting p of y given x, right? The prob so actually, given some sentence, what's the probability? You know, not what's the probability, but um, well, yeah. So, so give, given some sentence input, what are the tasks? So the actual task that we defined at the start of the lecture. And for this, we're going to use something called the Viterbi algorithm. So is, how many people here are familiar with dynamic programming? Raise your hand. OK, cool. All right, that's a good amount. I think that's more than in 2020. Like, Isan was like, how many people know about dynamic? And like, no one raised their hand. So that's good. Um, so Viterbi algorithm is like a classic dynamic programming algorithm. Um, and so if you don't know dynamic programming, that's OK. Um, we ha we're going to have a, uh, when, when you actually end up using this for homework six and project three, we're going to have a recitation spe separately just on dynamic programming. But to my understanding, it's a fairly popular concept, and it shows up on like leak code and stuff like that once in a while. So I mean, it might be a good concept to know at the very least as a kind of a base foundation. OK, so let's go back to that prediction problem um, where we're trying to predict, given some input sequence, uh, given some input sentence, we're trying to predict a part of speech tag sequence that has the maximum probability, right? So we're, we're back at the sequence level here. We're not talking about individual words or part of speech tags, just the most likely part of speech sequence for some sentence. So the naive approach to this is to try all possible Ys and choose the one with the highest probabilities, right? So you know, you, you, you just for all possible Ys, you calculate you know all the uh, dependencies and then you do that for all the possible y tags for that length L, um, and then you choose the one with the highest probability because you need to like soft max at the end, right? So that's one, that's one way to do it. But as you might have guessed, that's exponential time because it's L to the M um, possible y's. So that's absolutely not intractable, and we spent all this time building this you know beautiful model that's all that's allowing to do um, these tricks, and instead you know we're taking this naive brute force approach. So instead, we're going to come up with some trick. And we're going to come up, this trick involves taking this problem and splitting it up into smaller bytes of the problem that is also a recursive definition. And that, that's the, really the core of what allows us to kind of set up this dynamic programming structure. So real quickly, if you recall Bayes' rule, um, and this, is, this might seem kind of familiar, where if we're trying to calculate the argmax of um, y conditioned on x, you know, using the definition of conditional probability, we can redefine it as that joint distribution, joint distribution over p, p of x, right? But because p of x is given, we actually don't care, right? x is static throughout this entire process. x is the sentence that was given. So we don't care about the p of x, so we can just cancel that out or just get rid of that, and we just end up with argmax of the joint, uh, joint probability of x and y, right? And then, again, using the definition of uh, joint probability, we can end up back at the argmax of p of x given y um, times p of x. Again, we're talking about the talking about, we're, again we're talking about this at the sequence level, right? And it just happens so that those two factors are exactly the factors that we're storing in our model, right? So p of x given y, so p of um, x sequence given y sequence, uh, we can uh, define that as a product of um, p of x given uh, p of x given y um, for each element because again these are all independent right um, given given some y each x is independent so we can just multiply them out um, as independent uh, product of independence uh, independent probabilities and then for p of y um, now we just have the product of all the con uh, all the transition probabilities right because each y only depends on the previous y. So because of that, again, we can redefine this as this very simple um, product of <clears throat> uh, a product of independent probabilities. OK, so given that, all right, we're going to walk through this step by step. So don't, don't let your eyes glaze over just yet. I know it's like a lot of equations. 
Um, but <laughs> so now we're going to apply this dynamic programming trick. So first, we have, again, we, we just spent the previous slide going from this argmax of this joint probability to this product of independent um, probabilities, right, because of the assumptions that we've made in this model. And then this is a very common dynamic programming trick. We're going to isolate, because, because, we know I, because we know y is a sequence, we're just going to isolate the last element of y separately from the rest of the sequence of y, right? So we're just yanking out um, argmax of ym from the argmax of y as a whole sequence. So nothing in the expression has changed. We're just splitting the argmaxes into two expressions, right? Instead of the uh, sequence that maximizes the whole thing, we're taking the um, sequence that maximizes just up to m minus 1, and then we're, trying, we're finding the, um, that final element y that then maximizes um, in addition to that previous sequence, right? Um, right. And then this last step, we're going to pull out, we're going to, we're not marginalizing, we're going to pull out everything in that expression that has just y super m in it. So just that last element in it. So what does that mean? So we're going to break out, we break out that product. Um, that, so if you look at the transition probability, we're now breaking out ym given ym minus 1. Right? So we, we've bro broken that out. Um, and then we have, we've broken out probability of xm given ym. Right? So we've broken out, if this is the last part of the sequence, We've broken out this arrow and this arrow. Those, these two arrows are the first two elements um, in that, right? And then finally, that last probability is just this. It's just this circle, right? And so we're assuming that if we find the map, if we already have the maximum solution to this up to here, then we can just find the two additional arrows that gets us to the maximum probability um, here. Does that make sense? So we're, we're, we're chunking it. So instead of doing this all at once, we're saying, all right, what if we assume that we already have this and we just solve this part? Right? Um, let me see here. So we're, we're, you can kind of see we're defining this recursively, right? So instead of handling it all at once, we're saying, okay, let's just handle the last portion given m minus 1. And then you can imagine for that, we can also say, instead of m, we're just going to do m minus 1, m, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we've set, we're setting up a recursive definition. Yeah? Just to clarify the top line, you're saying R max of like the orbit sheet, and that's effectively the same thing as R max of the y. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, in the previous slide, uh, we had that um, we don't care about p of x, because p of x is already always static. So it's always proportional, so we don't care. Yeah, good question. Yeah, that's kind of a technicality. We should have done p of y given x there, but we sh we showed that it's still mathematically it's it's true. It's just semantically I would have preferred that to be p of y given x. Yeah. Okay. So again, what is this bottom half trying to show here? Let me see. Oh, <laughs> where did this come from? Okay, so this I'm going to keep going with this top half, which is this ym only depends on right. So ym only depends on ym minus one. This whole previous sequence, just via this transition probability. There's no other condition on conditions to the the rest of the sequence here. So we really only care about this last last element. And then again, we just recurse and recurse, recurse based on that. We're gonna go over this algorithmically too if this like equation doesn't make any sense. I'm trying to figure out what this second half here is because I don't remember why this is here. I get it mathematically, I'm just trying to figure out. Oh, okay, so we're just we're just rewriting the above as below, but now it's conditional, so that threw me off. So, but we, we agreed this is the same thing as the joint because of the previous slide. 
Um, right. And then, yeah, these are the two elements that are being stored in the model. OK, that's, that's weird. I don't know why that's just kind of sitting there. I probably, I, I'm probably missing a point there. But just the top half is, is the important part. That's the recursive um, definition for, uh, for, for this dynamic programming model, for this Viterbi algorithm. Um, so again, the big point here is that we're exploiting this memoryless property um, where, OK, that's what I just said, where the choice of YM only depends on the previous tag sequence, but only based on this transitional probability. All right, so let's, let's kind of cover this with an even denser notation, because th this is already complicated enough, right? Um, so again, uh, this dynamic prog programming routine, given some input x, right? so given some sentence, we're trying to compute the best length k prefix ending in each tag. So stay with me. So we're going we're gonna to walk through this. We're trying to identify the best length k sequence that ends in the tag verb, OK? And so the way we do that is by finding the best sequence argmax. Um, we're, we're finding the best sequence of length k minus 1, right? Where the uh, tag sequence of length k minus 1 plus verb has the highest probability given that k length input sequence, right? So, so this is just. Um, uh, the best, the best sequence of length k, given that it ends in verb. All right, so that that's the that's the important part. And then we have the same exact thing, except we're trying to find the best sequence that ends in noun. Okay, and then the claim is for the next length, right? So for k plus one. For, for, for the, the best sequence that ends in the verb tag, and this is kind of arbitrary. We're just doing this for all the tags, for verb, noun, adjective, adverb, et cetera. We're going to find the maximum probability of the sequence given a verb. But we only have to iterate through these examples. right? So potentially, in some other case, oh, I'm not going to draw that out, because that's actually quite complicated. We don't want to have to go through every single so let's say k is 3, right? We don't, have to, we don't want to have to go through every single possible combination of noun, 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 verb, noun, noun, adjective, noun, verb, noun, et cetera, to like, end up at this best probability at length 4, right, instead of 3. So instead, what we can do is we can find the best, best length 3 um, sequences that end in noun, that end in verb, that end in adjective, because again, we only care about the previous tag. So we only care about the tag that it ends on. So we just find the best length three sequence that ends in noun, that ends in verb, that ends in adjective. And then we only search through those when we do the next length. Right? So at the next step, when we say, what about the length four that ends in verb? Right? We only search through length three, um, the best solutions at length three. We don't have to go through every single possibility of length three. And so not only do we have, can we keep the, you know, the maximums, we can, we can even keep the probabilities, right? So we can pre-compute the probabilities of the best options of sequence three that ends in a noun, ends in a verb, et cetera, and then include that in our like, going forward probability calculation. Um, and so we get a recursive definition. So <clears throat> we would say for, and we're going to go through this again graphically. So, so we've covered it kind of mathematically in the previous slide. Here, we've co we're covering it algorithmically. And then we're going to cover it graphically. So if it still doesn't make, sen make sense, give me one more shot. <laughs> we'll try it again and then see if it makes sense then, OK? But again, we're, again we're, the concept is we're trying to set up this recursive definition so we don't have to brute force all positive POS tag sequences. We're just taking each thing independently because we're leveraging that only this um, transition probability um, is what matters going from sequence to sequence. Do you have a question? Thank you. I was going to ask, so uh, do we also compute for now like the, the k plus 1? Yeah, here. Yeah. So you do that for verb, now, yeah. all these things. Right. And so you go sequence through k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3, and you, you compute this for noun, verb, 
adjective, and then eventually you end up with a path um, of the best probability. And I'll show that graphically next. Yeah. All right. This is the punchline. Hopefully, this is this is what will make sense. And then you go, aha! That's so clever. Jake explained it so beautifully. All right. So first, <laughs> we have this first column. And we're asking, this is kind of trivial, right? So we're asking a sequence of one that ends in a verb. Uh, I don't like this D. I don't know why they don't you just use the article, uh, determiner. So we have the best sequence one that ends in verb, uh, determiner, and the noun, right? So this is fairly trivial. This is just the probability. If we have a start tag, so it'll be the transition from the start tag to verb, start tag to determiner, start tag to, um, start tag to noun. Um, right, and so you, you, that's just that joint probability. We have, we have that sort. That's easy, right? Now, the next thing we're going to do is for tag two, uh, for, for position two, we're going to store the best sequence ending in verb, the best sequence um, ending in the deter determiner, and the best sequence ending in noun. So we do that by first calculating, right? So we calculate these transition probabilities, so going from verb to verb, Determiner to verb, noun to verb. Um, so we, we already have we already have this side, and now we apply this side to end up here for each one of these. And then we take we keep the we keep just the best one. So we're trying to minimize storage. We're trying to minimize storage, and so we only keep the best one. So here, let's say going from noun to verb is the highest probability, so we keep that arrow. And now we do that for each of the tags, right? So for the second tag, we keep that arrow, and then for, for the determiner, it's most likely to have come from a verb, and then for the noun, it's most likely to have come from a determiner. Yeah? Um, could the noun go for... Yeah, yeah, so, so we consider multiple arrows first. So we calculate all those first, and we're just keeping the best. Right. So now we're skipping that and saying, all right, let's say these are the best. So now we now we have these three arrows, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're we're skipping that. Um, but yeah, so you would draw this arrow, this arrow, this arrow. This is the best one. This arrow. Oh no, this arrow, this arrow, this arrow. We've determined that this is the best one. So these are the best arrows at length two. These are best uh, sequences at length two of ending at each tag. So now we store that, and so we don't just store, by the way, the sequence. We also store uh, the probabilities, right, at each of these. And I just remember that we're going to go through this numerically once more, so plenty of time. <laughs> All right, so now for line three, we do the exact same thing. So again, remember, it only depends on the previous tag, so we just look at all the transition probabilities, and we take the best ones. So the claim here, the big takeaway here, is that when we do this, at length three, when we need to find out what the best sequence is that ends at v at verb at length three, we only need to check the solutions of the two length sequences, right? So uh, for example, um, and I don't know what the, yeah, sure. The concept here is just because this next one ends in v, the best sequence end, like here uh, that ended up at v for the second tag isn't going to change, right? So just because it was noun verb here, just because I add verb, it's not suddenly going to switch to verb, verb, verb to be the best probability, right? Because, again, of this conditional uh, assumption where it only depends on the previous one, right? There's no, like, information that gets gained from adding a third verb tag that suddenly makes the whole sequence where um, verb, verb, verb becomes more likely than noun, verb, verb, right? And we can actually show that kind of mathematically. So if we suppose that the best sequence y that ends with v is v, 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 and this is a proof by contradiction, right? Let's say we're trying to prove that um, for some reason, noun verb verb has a higher probability after going through the, going through the Viterbi algorithm. So when we calculate out the probabilities of VVV and noun VVV and NVV, the only three terms that differ between the definitions of these joint probabilities um, is these three terms. Right, y1 given y0, x1 given y1, and y2 given y3, one, y1. But none of these depend on y3, right? So it doesn't make sense that we would suddenly add y3 
and then this assumption, uh, this previous result would change, right? Because none of what, you know, uh, none of the uh, elements that make up these probabilities includes y3. Okay, so now we've stored it. We've stored the best um, sequence as well as their probabilities. And then we have this kind of optional n tag. Whoops. And then at the end, you know, when you're done, um, you essentially just take which whichever at the end here has the highest probability at the end, because you're you're multiplying all these. Right? So at the end, whichever has the highest probability, you just take the arrow path back all the way to the beginning, and that's your tag sequence. Yeah. Yes, that's a good point. I have a slide on that in, in a couple of slides. Yes, there's a solution to that. Yes. Uh, we just take the log, essentially. Yeah, but yeah. Well, I, have, I have a slide on that. I have slides. Okay. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> that's okay. Um, again, so going back to the formulation that we had before, we, for each k, 1 through n, we iteratively solve for each best sequence up to that k, right? Ending in each tag. So z looping over each POS tag. So for each position in, in k, that's k being the length of our sequence, we loop over each POS tag, and we find those best uh, sequences. Um, apparently, this is also known as mean uh, post posteriori inference, Latin. Um, <laughs> All right, one more example. And I'll burn through these pretty quickly, because I think the graphical example really nailed it in, but we're going to go through another numerical example just to show how this works mathematically. So again, let's say we have fish sleep. We have this uh, Markov chain of the transition probabilities, and we have the observation probabilities up there in that table. So let's say the first token is fish. So we calculate um, for a verb, likelihood that fish comes from verb is 0.5. And then the likelihood of transitioning to verb from start is 0.2, so 0.2 times 0.5, right? And then for noun, probability it's a fish given that it's a noun is 0.8, and then probability of transitioning to a noun from the start is 0.8, right? So 0.8 times 0.8. Then we get 0.1 and 0.64 for those nodes in the uh, Viterbi algorithm. And, and so we store that. And so we would have done this you know, for, um, oh no, actually, we're starting. So we have to do it from start. These are all zeros. So like, it wouldn't be the best. But, so the best transition would have been from start um, to noun or verb. right? All right, so for the second tag, sleep, um, if fish is a verb, what are we doing? Ah, yes. So if, if assuming, so now we're drawing these arrows, and then we're going to draw these arrows afterwards too, right? So if, if fish is a verb, then you take that point 0.1, and then you multiply it by um, transitioning from verb to a verb, which is point 0.1, so point 0.1 times point 0.1, and then the likelihood of uh, the probability of fish given verb, which is point 0.5, so point 0.1 times point 0.1 times point 0.5, and then you do that for the other word as well. You get your answer, and then you draw the other arrow. Where you calculate the other arrows, you start with 0.64, multiply it by the observation probability and the transition probability, you get your answer, and then you find the best one, right? So now those red arrows are your best option, right? So that, that is now the best sequence length too, um, whether you're ending on a verb or a noun. And then finally, it needs to end, right? So now we multiply, it has to end, so we're kind of imposing that it has to end, and so we take the transition probabilities going to the end, and then multiply it by um, each of the probabilities. And then finally, we have the maximum, right? So what's the, what has, which arrow chain has the highest probability at the end? You just follow that right back to the beginning, and there you go. There's your text for that input x.
Does that make sense? I have explained the Viterbi algorithm four times now using four different methods with various degrees of proficiency in explaining. Hopefully that makes sense, right? It, it's pretty clever. It, it really does make this computation a lot faster. Uh, it becomes tractable, um, and it's a lot easier to do. OK. Now, as you mentioned, with long sequences, this goes wrong um, because we get underflow, where we have a lot of small numbers, um, especially in a large data set with few observations. Some words are only observed once or twice, right, um, in a, like a 10,000 word data set or something. And so you get a lot of underflow where uh, small numbers get repeatedly mul multiplied together. And so you end up with exponentially small probabilities at the end. Um, and so even with like, this is especially a problem with like C or something where if your data type range isn't, doesn't have enough precision, right? You might run out of, you might literally just run out of decimal places. Less of a problem in Python because Python likes its massively precise uh, numbers, but um, in general in computer science, this is a problem. So instead of just using the probabilities directly, we can use the Viterbi algorithm with log probabilities. So we just slap a log in there, um, and that helps us with the underflow. And we can do that because um, the log function is monotonic, and so it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. As long as, it's mo as long as the function is monotonic, uh, we can use it to help us with the underflow problem. And so this is a pretty easy fix um, to that underflow problem. And yeah, worth pointing out that um, the log accumulates additively and not multiplicatively. Um, where we were multiplying before, with the log probabilities, you would just add them. OK, so as a quick recap, we had this independent classification example at the very front, uh, this naive assumption of just predicting each tag from each word. And we can't do that because English is complicated. Um, and the kind of context, the context of the sequence matters. And so instead, we, we um, define this first order um, hitter Markov model, and we use the Viterbi algorithm to, um, predict, uh, to predict y given x. Um, and we can do that because the uh, hitter Markov model, um, it models these pairwise, transition, uh, pairwise, between, pairwise transitions between states. Um, and so taking advantage of that, and, and, and I want to emphasize, the Viterbi algorithm really takes advantage of this assumption that we've baked into this HMM model, right? It, 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 it only works because of the assumptions that we've made here. Um, and so it's a, it's a good um, kind of fit, if you will, um, between the Viterbi algorithm and the assumptions baked into the model. So anytime you can find this kind of way to exploit a structure, right? Exploit an assumption and massively impute your, uh, improve your compute. That's always, that's always good. OK, any questions on the Viterbi algorithm? All right. I'm also like, I'm getting tongue twisted, like trying to explain <laughs> you know, the same thing four times. But it, it is fairly, um, once you get it, it's easy. But trying to kind of understand it for the first time, especially if you don't have dynamic programming experience, it, it, it is a little challenging. Um, and explaining it is also a bit of a challenge, especially with the kind of um, notation-heavy examples. I much prefer the graphical example, because it's kind of obvious, OK, we're finding the best paths up to each point. It's independent, so we can, we can do this. And we just follow the uh, arrows back at the, at the very end. OK, so we're going to spend the rest of this lecture, um, the last 15, 20 minutes here, talking about how to train these um, hidden Markov models. Yeah, sure. So um, now we're looking at what happened, happened yesterday, like the first, like the most previous one. When you, when you do these also, like, or compute, like, so the second order model, yeah, mm -hmm. that looks like in the third order and the fourth, and where, where do we stop? Why? That's a very extensive question. <laughs> I, I can post, I, I'll, I'll post some um, additional reading materials on second order uh, hidden Markov models. But it is fairly similar. You just have more terms, right? Yeah. Um, so instead of you know, y given y, uh, yk given yk minus 1, it's just yk minus 1 comma yk minus 2, right? But it's the same, same exact thing. It's just more complicated with more terms. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So. To train this HMM, there's a couple ways of doing this. There's a supervised way of training it, 
and there's an unsupervised way of training it, which is what you're going to be using on Project Three. Okay, so let's talk about the supervised training because it's actually quite straightforward. Um, we're given we're given some word sequence and tag sequence pairs. So we're given x, y pairs up front. And we want to estimate um, this joint distribution, joint probability, just using that training set. This is just my maximum likelihood. Um, and so, hold on. Sorry, just a second. OK, so this is just maximum likelihood. So it's the same exact way in um, naive phase, you just count. right? It's just frequency count. Um, so let's let's show that um, a little bit more formally. So first, uh, remember that with same thing with naive phase, we can formulate this uh, in this kind of matrix formulation, where we define this transition matrix A that's um, uh, that's encoding all of the transitions between noun, verb, 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 uh, whatnot. We express that previously as that Markov chain with the circles and the arrows. We, we can just express that as a table as well and have a matrix uh, representation. Um, commonly, it's called A. Or I've seen it as T because it's the transition matrix, but A, sure. Um, and then also we have this observation matrix O, and that's the, that's the same as uh, naive base, where we have um, X given Y. And that's the obser observation matrix. And we saw that in the naive base formulation as well. <clears throat> so given this matrix formulation, we can convert our previous definition using like these probabilities. Um, and so we can. Uh, define this as matrix matrix multiplication instead. Well, not really matrix multiplication, but you, we can define them as matrices instead. And then we can come up with the um, negative log formulation, log probability formulation. Oh, and that's that's not negative log. And this would be this would be the log probability formulation um, if we were to use log Viterbi <coughs> instead of regular Viterbi. And note that it changes from a probability uh, from a product to a sum, right? Because we're taking the log of all these probabilities. So Kind of using that, are we using that? Why aren't we using, okay. Anyways, coming back from the matrix formulation. So to do the maximum likelihood of, um, so we're finding the matrices A and O that maximizes the likelihood of our training set. Um, you just estimate um, each component separately by counting, right? So for A, which is the transition probabilities, um, you just calculate, um, so the, you just count the number of times noun verb uh, shows up. And then you divide it by the number of times noun showed up, right? Um, so that's just the probability that given you're at noun, what's the probability that it'll be going to verb? You just count, right? Um, and then same thing for the observation probabilities um, for each word. You just count the number of times it shows up with the noun tag or the verb tag or whatnot. And then you divide it by the times that um, the verb tag has appeared, right? So this is just, we're just counting. It's the same thing as naive phase. And then using the same kind of proof as we did during naive phase, uh, we can prove that this is the optimal solution by uh, taking the minimum log likelihood formulation, setting the gradient to zero, and then doing all the math that we did previously with naive base. We can do the same exact thing, and we can show that the frequency counts from the training set is indeed the optimal solution for maximizing the likelihood. Okay? All right, we're, we're just counting. We just count the arrows, the number of times that each arrow occurs. Okay, so again, super easy. Uh, same thing as naive base, uh, except we have more arrows, right? Uh, you just count, um, and it's super easy, and we can do that. Why we can do that? Because everything com uh, decomposes into a product of pairs, right? Because of, again, the structural assumptions of the model. Oh, yeah, and note that um, this transition probability doesn't depend on where you are in the sequence at all. It's totally position um, agnostic, or it's shift invariant, right? Uh, we can. It doesn't matter if you're transitioning from the first to the second word or whatnot. It's just a transition. So let's uh, talk about the complexity real quick, number of parameters. Um, so again, number of transitions is just tag squared, whereas the observations is word time, the number of words times the number of tags. And like I mentioned before, this avoids modeling word, word to word pairings. And so we don't have to do 10,000 times 10,000. We can just do 10 times 10 and then 10 times 10,000. And that significantly reduces the complexity. Any questions on supervised training? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you just count the number of times each pair occurs in your training set. All right, unsupervised training. This is a lot more interesting um, because how do you train your model when you don't have Ys, right? So I have no tag information. I just have a corpus of text. How can I train my HMN model, um, Hidden Markov model? 
And so this gets less into um, part of speech tagging, although you could certainly use this for part of speech tagging in a certain formulation. But it, it gets more into language modeling, right? Um, so we're not trying to perform a task per se. We might be trying to train a better generative model, right? So we'll, we'll kind of see that. So even if we have no whys, even if we just have a training set of sentences, we still want to estimate probability of the joint probability of x comma y. And, and in this case, you can kind of see y as a hidden state, right? That's why we call it a hidden Markov model, where the Markov chain, or rather the um, sequence to sequence transition, is in this hidden state, not in the observed, uh, not in the observed variables. So why might we want to do this? So why do we? So previously we were motivated by the part of speech tagging um, task. Why might we want to um, do this instead? So supervised data is really hard to acquire. So if you know, uh, unless you're Amazon Mechanical Turking uh, or you're paying a lot of people a lot of money to sit down and label your data, it's 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 really difficult. Um, whereas unsupervised data is really plentiful. You can just download Wikipedia, right? And suddenly you have as much data as you need. Um, and it turns out that modeling language like this is super useful um, because you can use it for other downstream tasks, including POS tagging if you kind of formulate it cleverly, right? So um, this is kind of what we talked about before with word to vec kind of, right, like where we're trying to um, create a general language model instead of trying to perform a specific task very well. So we can do this. We can train a model. We can do unsupervised training of an HMM using the EM algorithm, which is this expectation maximization algorithm, where we alternate between two things, right? Um, we, kind of, we kind of covered that with uh, latent factor models, right, with the SVD-like models. Um, the alternation here, and this is called Baum-Welsh specifically for um, HMM models. The alternation here is that if we had labels, right, if we had Ys, we would just be able to do maximum likelihood. But if we had um, AO, like the matrices AO, so, so Wait, let me back up. If we had labels y, we would be able to use maximum likelihood to calculate A and O just by counting, right? Whereas if we had A and O, we could just feed the model forward to predict the y's themselves, right? So this is the chicken and egg. This is the alternation that we're setting up. So what we're going to do is we're going to initialize A and O randomly, as we often do in these kind of models. Even with the latent factor model, we um, defined the U and V arbitrarily. So here we're going to initialize A and O arbitrarily. We're going to predict probabilities of y's for each training x. And then we're going to count those y's to estimate a new a and o. Right? So that's the alternation. So we're going to randomly initialize our model, predict some y's um, for, each, for each training set x. And then using that y, we're going to estimate the new a o until it converges or like things don't change anymore. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then we repeat until convergence. So we call this first step the expectation step, and then we call this uh, second step, or sorry, the second step we call it the expectation step, and the third step we call the maximization step. My notes are worryingly sparse on this section, but we'll be fine. Anyways, <laughs> so this is, this is the alternation. So let's look at the expectation step first. So given some A and O, right? So given all of the arrows that exist, um, for given some training X, we can predict y for each. Um, we can predict. We can predict. Uh, we can predict each position's y um, for each of the positions given this x, right? So um, for x1, we can calculate the probability of noun, a, a determiner verb, noun determiner verb, etc., um, all the way down the rest of the sequence. So this encodes the current model's beliefs about y, and so we calculate the marginal distribution of each y i. Um, so again, with a completely randomly initialized a, a and O, and remember that A is our transition matrix, so it's these arrows up here, and then O is our observation matrix, so it's these arrows down here. So given, given those, given the arrows, and given X, we can always predict the um, probability of each Y. And then the maximization step um, it's just the maximum likelihood over the marginal distribution. So previously, we had these labels. We had, we had these given y's, so we can just count them. Instead, in the unsupervised case, we need to do a soft count. So instead of counting ones and zeros, we, we're actually counting. We're actually taking these probabilities into account, these marginal probabilities into account. Um, so we're 
calculating the probability of the transition over the probability of the original, the, the previous state, and then we're um, calculating the probability of each y uh, where x is given, right, um, over y. What? Oh, 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 this is uh, the one function, so yeah. So we're, 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 we're just counting for here, and we're just counting for here, and we're taking into account that these are probabilities and not just one zero counts. Okay, so you might have noticed that during this expectation step, we need to compute these marginals. So we need to compute the probability of each position being a noun, a determiner, or a verb based on the input x, right? So this is actually kind of non-trivial, even if you have all the arrows, um, because it needs to be conditioned on the entire input sequence x, right? So we actually need to use dynamic programming to solve this. So this is quite similar to Viterbi, and I frankly don't have that much time to spend kind of going through all of it. But I'm going to walk through it now, and it's going to be covered again during the, um, during the dynamic programming recitation. And then I'm going to post some additional reading material, and you can see the slides after. But I'm going to try my best to explain it here. But for some definitions, you're going to have to just take my word for it. OK? All right. I, I can't prove the four backward algorithm right now. Uh, that, that's like quite a bit into the theoretical. OK, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of treat this intuitively. So we need to define first these two things. We're going to have these two notations. So first, we're going to, we're going to calculate alpha which is the probability of observing prefix one, uh, x1 through i and having the ith, ith state be z, right? So like I said, we need to calculate the marginal probability of y given the entire sequence. But for now, we're just going to take it up to the current sequence. Um, and we're going to calculate the probability of, of observing right. We're going to calculate the probability of observing just this sequence, oh, I'm going to start here. Um, just this sequence and observing the ith state to be some z, so noun, verb, determiner, whatever, um, given a and o, right? So that's the forward um, part of this. That's alpha. And then for beta, we're going to calculate the probability of observing the suffix, everything that comes after the current position that we care about, um, given the ith state being um, uh, verb, noun, uh, whatnot. So typically when you explain this, you kind of do this, where first going forward, we calculate this probability conditioned on this, right? And then when we go backwards, we calculate the probability of, wait, did I get that right? No. Wait, hold on. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> So we calculate, I should have included the current. So this is forward, this is alpha, right? Where we calculate the probability of observing this bottom part um, and this tag based on all of the arrows. And then on the backwards, we probability, uh, the probability of observing just this sequence um, given that this is a verb or a noun or whatnot, um, as well as all the other um, A's and O's. So again, I, I, I can't really go through like why we're doing this. There's some like message, uh, message transfer theory um, going on here. But so we call this the forward backward, backward algorithm because this part's going forward up till the Y that we're uh, uh, calculating the marginal, uh, mar marginal probability for, and uh, beta goes backwards, right? And so using alpha and beta, we can compute the marginal um, of this being verb or a noun given this entire sequence x. And you'll have to take my word on that for now. If you want to see the proof, I'll post some additional reading material. Um, yeah, and then you can calculate the um, marginal of the transitions as well. I'm using the same method, but it gets pretty complicated as you can see there. So. Again, I, I don't have too much time here, but the forward algorithm you can do with dynamic programming, with the Viterbi, in the same way, right? We're calculating this, given this. That means I can calculate this, given this, et cetera, right? We can define 
smaller recursive portions to define this dynamic programming um, algorithm. Um, the Turby wants to point out that you would do a max instead of a sum here. And then for the, uh, for the backward, again, um, naively, you would do this by you know, calculating every x, um, x, y joint over z, a, and o. But instead of doing that, we would compute this recursively. So again, alpha runs forward, beta runs backward, and then for each training, uh, for each training example x, we calculate each, uh, we compute each marginal probability y um, for each uh, y sequence, for each hidden state in the sequence, uh, using this forward backward, backward algorithm. Um, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry this is only three or four slides, but I think you are going to have to implement this in the next homework. So I'll, I'll make sure I post enough kind of materials to, for you to be able to do this. Um, this is also kind of explaining it in a kind of a equation-y way. I think if you see this in an algorithmic way, it's going to make a lot more sense. And then for the project, I think you can use whatever you want. You don't have to use your own implementation. OK, so again, a quick recap on unsupervised training. We can now train an HMM I'm using only word sequences using the forward backward ENM algorithm, um, where Ys are hidden states. Um, and all pairwise transitions are through Ys. We're never um, modeling pairwise transitions between X. And that's why it's called a hidden Markov model. And we train this using the ENM, uh, EM algorithm, which converges to a local algorithm. All right, two more slides. So one thing that I didn't mention for unsupervised is uh, this initialization. Like, how do you choose the number of hidden states, right? So previously, the number of hidden states was the number of tags, right? Noun, verb, uh, adjective, whatnot. Um, but for this, it's, you almost treat it like a latent variable, right? Like, you don't know the dimension. Um, and so you just use, you just choose it by hand, or you try all of them, and then you do cross-validation, and you pick the best one, right? So there's no real answer for what the correct hidden, um, hidden state should be. But you can imagine if it's more than six, it might do better, right? So for part of speech tagging, uh, it didn't really make sense for it, like, because you would be able to predict your entire part of speech tag sequence, and then just predict each word, right? So it could be like, the dog ran to the car, and the car ran to the dog probably has like pretty equal like, uh, probability, right? Because only the part of speech matters. But here you would imagine for an unsupervised uh, model, if you give it a little bit more room to work with, it would learn something a little, a little bit more meaningful to be able to generate more interesting text, which is exactly what you're going to do for project three. So quick recap, last slide. Um, again, sequence prediction and HMMs. We're modeling pairwise dependencies and sequences uh, with this HMM structure. Um, where for um, I fish often, if you just do independent prediction, um, it's wrong. But with HMM Viterbi, um, we can take context into account and uh, create generate far more um, accurate tag predictions. It's very compact because we're only modeling these pairwise uh, relationships, and we're never modeling pairwise relationships between the text. And the main limitation is that it makes a lot of independence assumptions, and it has poor predictive accuracy compared to some other more advanced methods. All right, so that's it. Um, like I said, for the next lecture, um, I'm trying to identify what topics I want to cover on Tuesday. So if you have ideas, just come up to the podium after class or um, answer my post on Piazza and give me some ideas. If not, I'm just gonna, I have my own topics, obviously, but I'm trying to gauge the interest of the class. Um, and then on Thursday and then next Tuesday, we have the advanced lectures from Dr. Mandrake. Um, and then there, today, there's a probability recitation. Um, and it will not be a recap of Viterbi and forward and backward. That will be the next recitation. I mixed that up. Uh, today will just be a straight up probability recitation if you need to catch up on probability theory. Thank you.